Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you, Lord, because we gave glory to you this morning. And Lord, we continue to give glory to you and what you have done in this hour, knowing that these are just special things for me. But I know each and every one of your children has those things in their hearts. And so, Lord, maybe if we put them all in a book, we'd have the book of Acts again, the Alpha and the Omega. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> <clears throat> so it's good to see you, Joan. And uh, now we're going to look at the 20th time, actually 22nd time, I witnessed God's supernatural presence. And it was in 1997. And I was holding service in, uh, in church down in Kentucky when I asked to pray for several people in the church who had gotten sick from the extreme heat we had felt all week. Now, I know <clears throat> there's a... Uh, I could name them by name, but I, I just won't do that for the sake of them. But uh, for six days, there had been no rain, and the temperatures were over 100 degrees, 102 to be exact, on that Sunday. Uh, the temperatures had been around 100 for six days, and there seemed to be no end in sight. The official forecast said that it would be that way for another week or so. My prayer was a simple one. I asked the Lord, seeing that those... Uh, were his children, not mine, that I was asking him to change the weather by 30 degrees for their sake. After church, we went out to eat at a local restaurant. Afterwards, uh, after we were finished, which was about 45 minutes, we walked outside and I looked up in the sky and I saw a funny small cloud shaped like a man's fist freely floating through the, through the sky. It was a completely black cloud, but it was only real small, you know. And... Uh, I turned to the brothers and said, it reminds me like in the days of Elijah when he looked up and saw the cloud like a fist and he said, I hear the abundance of rain. So I said to the brothers, brothers, something is about to happen. Then from there we went to Lowe's to look at, for carpet for Michael and Helena who were going to move uh, to the back of the church from New Jersey. <clears throat> so um, Michael and I were looking at carpet and, I, I, and I, I, you know, I told them we don't buy on Sunday, but we can look. And so we were looking at carpet uh, they had available, but since we did not know purchasing on Sunday, we were just there to look. And suddenly the power in the building went, out, went off and the backup emergency power came on. I said, something is happening outside. We went to the front of the store and walked outside. And there was a, a black cloud as far as the eye could see from east to west. It was about one mile high and, uh, and about one mile thick. It was traveling very fast, and, and within an hour, the temperature had dropped from 102 degrees to between 70 to uh, 72 degrees that we had asked for. Now, God certainly answered our prayers. He dropped the temperature by 30 degrees that we had asked for. After that, my telephone rang off the hook all the rest of the day with people in the church remembering our prayer, and all I could say was, well, what do you expect when you ask God for something in prayer? He does it. And, you know, he's, he, you know, he, and then I think I quoted, I said, you know, he said, if you ask for uh, a fish, or if you ask for a fish, he wouldn't give you a stone. And uh, if you ask for, uh, no, if you ask for a fish, he wouldn't give you a serpent. And if you ask for bread, he wouldn't give you a stone. So, you know, you get what you ask for. All right. Well, anyway, um, so, you know, if you think about the, amount of the megatonnage of power that brought about that storm because <clears throat> that storm was like a bulldozer and it pushed all the hot air out and just brought in cool air, all right? Well, the 21st time I was witness to the power of God was in 1999. <clears throat> I went to Australia to hold meetings and uh, we held meetings in the pastor's home. He had a young boy who was deaf, I believe it was Jonathan, and I felt led to offer prayer for him. And we prayed for him in the church service and then thought nothing about it afterwards. The next day, his aunt was vacuuming her house and thought it strange that her vacuum cleaner sounded so, low, so loud. Then she took her daughter to school and remarked, there must be something wrong with the car as it's so loud. When she got home, her telephone rang and one of her sisters was on the other line. And she remarked, there must be something wrong with my phone because it's so loud. And finally, she said to the sister, just a minute. Do I always talk this loud? And when, when she realized then that uh, she had been praying so intensely uh, for her nephew uh, you know, to be healed, that actually God healed her. 
And, uh, you know, because I had laid hands on him the other night and that she must have received the healing instead of him. Well, praise God for his wonderful power. She had been diagnosed for 25 years with industrial hearing loss, which means her hearing was, she could hear, but it was very, it's like she had her fingers in her ears, you know, or she had earplugs on because she couldn't hear very good. And now all of a sudden she's hearing perfect. So we thank the Lord for that, and, uh, and she was healed. Now, the 22nd time I witnessed the power of God <clears throat> was in July of 1999. We had visited Doc Cash's church in Tennessee and preached for his church. And a young man in his church had cut down some, um, he, had, he cut down a, a, a basically, it looked like bamboo, but it was just a, a stick. And uh, if you just, let me just bring it out here. So this should only take a second. <clears throat> but this stick, and Peter, I want you to feel how light the stick is. Okay, it's very light. All right. If anybody else wants to touch it later, that's fine. But um, so this is what the stick looks like, and uh, what happened was. Uh, a young man in his church had cut down some trees next to Doc's house and uh, had made walking sticks for him. So I, I, I thought that was kind of nice. So I asked him for a couple of those sticks for myself uh, that I, too, may make walking sticks. So when I got at home in November, in, um, it was in July, I debarked it. You can see there's no bark on this thing. I took my knife and just kind of scraped them all, scraped it all down as smooth as I could. And anyway, this stick lay in my garage for July, August, September, October, November, and, and, and then in November something happened, okay? And I'll tell you about that. So anyway, um, so that's five months in November. And it was, we were down there for July 4th weekend. So, um, you know, so it was a full month of July. Now, in November, I went, I went out of town for a business trip to Long Island, New York. And while I was gone, the police come to the front door and asked my wife if she had anything, uh, had seen anything out of the ordinary as he found a man rolled up in carpet a couple of miles from our house at Highway 71, the exit up the road. <coughs> well, when the police left, she went in the garage and found this debarked stick, walk, this walking stick, and stuck it under my bed on my side of the bed. She wanted something to defend herself with if somehow someone tried to break into the house while I was gone. Well, when I got home, she told me about the visit from the police, but forgot to mention the stick. For the next five months, I slept on the stick, or over the stick, which I knew not was under my body, because there was a bed skirt on our bed which kept out any light from uh, being able to see under the bed. In late March, the week before Easter, I was vacuuming under my bed and I heard a clunk. I reached under the bed and pulled out the walking, this walking stick. And it was growing right here and right here and here. It was growing. You can see the knot and you can see the knot on that side. It, it was growing. It had a leaf that came out this far and about that much of it was uh, like a shoot for a branch and then the leaf was there. So on both sides of the stick, it grew out, it, it grew um, just like in the book of, the, you know, in the, in the Bible, when Moses had left his stick in the holiest of holies, or Levi did, and uh, when he came back the year later, it grew two limbs, all right? So <clears throat> basically, it was growing two shoots with a leaf on each, uh, on each side of, of the shoot forming a cross. I asked my wife about it. And she told, you know, I wonder if I would have had put that in water it, it, and it would have grown out a full two big branches, you know. But anyway, but they were small. But um, it reminded me, anyway, of Aaron's rod that he left in the holiest of holies for a year and it budded, okay? So I kind of kept that, you know, I, I've kept it in my study ever since because I think it's kind of a testimony that the power of God is still with us in this hour. Now, the 18th time. I, I was witness to the power of God. It was 2006, and I went to Rwanda to hold meetings. A brother wanted to take my camera and take some pictures. These are the knots here, by the way. But anyway, uh, a brother wanted to uh, take my camera 
and take some pictures of the ministers with me in them. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't know that if you hold down the button, it would take a continuous picture of four or five pictures. You know, if you just hold down, it would tick, 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 right? So he thought he was just clicking to take a pic one picture, but held the button down and took four shots in about less than a second. Well, these are the four shots that took place within a second, okay? The first shot you see here, there's a light. Now, <clears throat> that could be explained. <clears throat> you know, if you were carnal, you would say, well, that's just a, a glare from the camera's uh, flash. But I didn't have a flash. It was one of those old cameras that took JPEG pictures. They were not even like, not even, I think they're like th three or four hundred, uh, you know, uh, they, they certainly weren't uh, the megapixels like we have today, okay? So anyway, the second shot, you can see here that the light, which was above here, above his head here, was now descending. All right? The second shot showed the light that began descending down in the middle of the ministers, right, and uh, at their head in, in, the, in the last row. And, you know, to be honest with you, when I got back, I just kind of took my discs and I, I downloaded everything to my computer, and I just kind of left it. And one day I was looking at mission pictures, and I said, what are these? And it was like 10 years later, and I saw, wow, these, this is something that God did, and I didn't even know he was doing it. Okay? The third picture, you can see the lights on my shoulder. It descended uh, among the ministers and sat on my left shoulder. Then the fourth picture showed the light completely covering my body, and the only thing that you see was my Bible. All right, so it's just completely got me. You can see my Bible in my hand, but the rest of me is all completely white. So anyway, uh, the 23rd time I witnessed the power of God was in 2006 after our meeting in Rwanda, and we went straight from there to Rukungiri. There, were held, uh, there we held a Sunday meeting for everyone, but on Monday we held the first of our ministry meetings for Western Uganda and Eastern Congo. And we began at 9 o'clock sharp, and uh, by 9.05, something took place. Well, the winds began and were so strong, and the rain was so swift with large raindrops about this size mixed with hailstones the size of golf balls. I could not even hear myself preach, even though uh, uh, they had no sound system. So I had to teach the 35 pastors assembled using just my voice. Now, their church was actually bigger than this church. Okay? It, 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 uh, it was probably about... Maybe, well, if we included our foyer, it would be that size, okay? So it was a, it was a bigger church, but um, they didn't have electricity in the church. And I was just projecting my voice, but I couldn't hear myself at this point even speak, okay? So I went to sit down. But since the rain was so loud, along with the fierce winds rattling and wobbling the, the roof metal, I walked over to the side where about that window's at, and I began to sit down. Then something happened. Before I was halfway to the log bench, something spoke to me and said, have not I sent you? And I said, yes, Lord, you did send me. And he said, then take charge of the meetings. Now, I didn't hear this audibly, but I did hear it audibly, all right, if you know what I mean. I didn't hear it with my ears, but I heard it with my inner ear, all right? <clears throat> now, so uh, I had no clue what to do in order to take charge of the situation. I mean, here we got a, a huge storm outside. So I started, but I started immediately walking to the pulpit. And my first step was my left foot. And it, uh, uh, as, as I began to step forward, and ha I had a mental vision. My eyes were wide open, but I saw about a 30-second viewing of Jesus in the boat. Now, I can't tell you that I saw it with my eyes because my eyes were open. I could see everybody there. But I saw it with my mind. So I call it a daydream or a mental vision because that's what we have when we're kids, when we think we're fishing, but we're actually in class and we're supposed to be learning our spelling or something. But <clears throat> I had what was called a mental vision. My eyes were wide open, but I saw about a 30-second viewing of Jesus in the boat. It seemed like 30 seconds, but it only lasted a half of a second. Now, explain that. I can't explain that. Time was just sped up. Just, just saw the whole thing. I saw the waves were beating upon the boat, and the rain was coming down, and there Jesus was asleep in the boat. His, but his disciples were afraid, 
And so they woke him, and Jesus raised up, and he said, Peace be still, and the storm abated. I had been teaching the ministers about Jesus' relationship with his father. All right. Then, as I was ready to take my second step with my right foot again, I had about another 30-second viewing, which seemed to take but half of a second. I saw William Brand running around a tree in Colorado after the huge storm stopped, and this squirrel was chattering, and he was, you know, he, he was just glorifying God. Well, the next four steps to the pulpit, the devil was on my back, and I could hear him saying to me, you will be making a fool of yourself. And I could only think of a man who had a billboard sign on him that when he approached you, he said, I'm a fool for Christ. And when you turned your head to see what was behind him, the billboard said, whose fool are you? Now, when I was in 19, uh, I think 74, <clears throat> maybe it's 75, yeah, 74, I was at the Rose Bowl, and I attended the Rose Bowl. And, uh, but I had walked down through Los Angeles, and I saw a man with a billboard on that said one thing about Christ and then the other thing about Christ. So it reminded me of the same thing. So I approached the pulpit and thought, all I can do is what my older brother Jesus and what William Branham and other older brother did before me. But Jesus was the oldest. And, uh, and I told the brothers, let's bow our heads in prayer. I then told Satan his stinger was pulled out of Calvary and that although he was the prince and power of the air, yet because Calvary, uh, at Calvary's stinger was pulled out, then he was just a bluff. And I said, I take every spirit in here under my control for the glory of God. Now, can you imagine sitting in a, in a, in a church and the minister saying that and then all of a sudden the storm stopping? All right, but it did. I then said, I command this storm to stop in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And within seconds it stopped, and we have it on film. And uh, we continued our meetings, and it was so quiet, all you could hear was a drip, drip, and then another drip as the water emptied off the roof. We continued on for another three and a half hours until we broke for lunch. <clears throat> At that time, I walked outside and looked out to the west, and then to the north, then to the south, and then around the building to the east, and, and all I could see was storm clouds everywhere I looked, and then something said, look up. When I did, I saw a hole in the clouds like God had uh, then had taken a cookie cutter one mile in circumference and pulled out the middle of the storm clouds. Okay, That's all it looked like to me. It looked like we were setting in the eye of a tornado like a storm. Then we got into the car, drove to our hotel to have lunch, and we had to drive into the fury of the storm. We ran and tried to dodge the raindrops and there ate a lunch to the sounds of pounding rain and wind. It was the worst lunch I've ever had. Then, and not the food itself, but the atmosphere. Then we ran back to the car, drove back to the church about three kilometers to peace and quiet. All right. Then the hole closed up, 24. Okay. I begin to preach the second sermon on the father and son and sons, showing how we were in, in, uh, to conduct our lives after the pattern of the firstborn son of God. About 30 minutes and the hole closed up and the storm returned with all of its fury. The raindrops, uh, the hell size, uh, golf ball sized stones resumed. The wind seemed to want to lift the roof off. And so I said, brothers, let's bow our heads. I knew that if I prayed again, God would honor my prayer. But something said, I want the other ministers to pray this time, for they also are sons. And if you only pray, then they will want to make you more than just their brother. They will try to make you like my prophet. <laughs> so I said, brothers, God wants you to pray this time, uh, for you are also sons. And he told me, if I pray alone, you will want to make me more than just your brother. So we prayed like only African brothers can pray. And you know what happened? We got the same results that we had gotten earlier when I prayed. And we continued to teach until 5 p.m. without any more distractions. Now, the 25th time I was witness to the power and presence of God, it was in 2007. And I found myself on another missionary trip to Congo and Congo DRC. The episode was when I was preaching in Mabanza Nagungu. The first day we began with a television broadcast to the people of Mabanza Nagungu, invited them to the meetings. 
Then we proceeded to the church where we held a meeting for the church people. And I was very upset by the music. It was not or orderly, but rather much chaos was involved. They sang and played music for almost two hours, having a bongo competition between two brothers that lasted only a, well, over about 20 minutes. <coughs> now, if you can imagine, <clears throat> off to your right, you could almost reach them. Two fellows going away at the bongos, you know, and having a competition. I mean, it was just the pastor had a ball, had seven balls because they they had been seven thunders believers. <coughs> they had seven balls. I don't know if that's because they had seven, but I, I guess it is because uh, he, the pastor got up later and said, "I want to apologize. Our music is wrong because you know we sat under a certain minister, and that's that's how we learned." Our music was from him. And of course, he was from the United States, and he should have known better. <clears throat> well, I noticed some sisters had danced in the aisles, and finally, when the music stopped and I approached the pulpit, those sisters were all wore out and slouching in their chairs. So I rebuked the church and told them the music was to be reverent and quiet, creating a soul-searching experience. The next day, at the minister's meeting, the pastor came forth first and apologized for the music the night before, and told the ministers not to be angry with me for rebuking them, for they had never been taught better. Then he returned, he turned the service over to me, and I taught on the relationship between God and his firstborn son, Jesus, and his other sons. Now suddenly there was a clamor of excited voices, and you could hear on the outside of the church, and what had happened was, when I began to preach, a rainbow was seen for about 500 meters away, hanging only 10 meters above the ground, and was heading for the church. He got to the neighbor's property where the sisters were preparing the minister's lunch, and then paused for about 10 minutes. That is when the clamor of voices could be heard outside. Then it moved on, it settled over the church, and you can see the picture up on the screen, and uh, this is just one of many. <clears throat> it was actually the, uh, he, the guy that was filming the meetings inside, he then was told about it, so he then stopped filming the meetings, and he went outside, and he took pictures of what was going on. He was a Baptist man and said, I'd never seen anything. I'd never witnessed anything like this. Well, then the second, the, the rainbow, which was vertical, okay, that's straight across, it, it, in shape, it proceeded to hang above the church, still remaining at 30 feet above the ground, and only about three meters above the church peak, okay? Uh, you know, like we have a peak up here. It held its position above the church for about 25 minutes and was soon joined by another vertical rainbow. When, it, when that second rainbow joined to the first rainbow, it became in a bowl shape and it held for another 20 minutes and then was joined by a third rainbow that was joined to the first two. And when it did join, it became a full circle hanging over the church until my sermon was over, then it disappeared. The surprising thing is that is this was done in the dry season, of which there was, only, there was no rain and only a few clouds floating by. One of the sisters commented, it's, look, it's a rainbow. And another sister said, it can't be a rainbow. This is a dry season. It must be the pillar of fire. All right. That's exactly what Brother Brown called it in the message of grace. When he talked about those three rainbows, he said it was a pillar of fire. And he said it was the most outstanding uh, manifestation of God's presence in my entire ministry. Well, and then the, the Holy Spirit spoke out to Brother Branham and said, the reason for the rainbow is that I'm showing you that what you have preached for the last 30 years is the truth. Well, then I would say that, you know, Jesus, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then this, the rainbow was there because I was saying what Brother Branham was saying. Now, <clears throat> the 26th time I was witness to the power of God was in 2002, but I was not made aware until about eight years ago. I preached in Stephen Abali's church in Uganda, and a couple approached me in the prayer line. They were married eight years at the time and could not have children. I laid hands on them and asked my father God to give them children. Eight years later, I was informed by a pastor, Brother uh, Moses, Swaga Moses Belita, a uh, pastor there, that God has now blessed them with four children. 
I even had to be reminded by the pastor that I had laid hands on them and I prayed for them because, you know, you forget things. You, you know, so many people come through the prayer lines. Well, <clears throat> that, that is the same time, the same service that we had the four people with TB that I didn't find out till today that nobody has died from TB in that church in 21 years since then. And yet we prayed for four people with TB that had their doctors had told them that they were confirmed TB, you know, had TB. So I just say that, you know, we, you know our, mem- our minds don't even comprehend all the things that God has done for us. But, you know, every one of you could, could give times in your life where God has been done something supernatural and you can't explain by physical mechanics, how it could take place. All you can say is, look, I trust it was God, and just leave it to that. Put it in your book. Because if every one of us had a booklet like this, 34 pages here, 32 pages, 33, then, you know, all these people, 33 times 30, I mean, you're going to have 1,000 pages. You're going to have another book of Acts. And, you know, we're supposed to have another book of Acts in our church. So, all right. So the 27th time uh, I was witness to the power of God was in 2012. I was in Argentina, and we were holding joint services for, for several churches at Brother Juan Palacio's church in Rumipal town and, Eri- and Enrique, Enrique, Enrique Vila's church from Cordoba, the capital city, that came together in Rumipal. It was very hot. The church was so packed, about 300-plus people. The temperature outside was over 100. Their church was about the size of Brother Vale's. So it was a good size. <laughs> the, the temperature outside was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Plus, I had, taken, I had to take off my, my outer coat, my jacket, before I started to preach. I remember this, the same scene in 1997 in my church back in Kentucky. So when I prayed, I asked the Lord to drop the temperature by 30 degrees like he did for his children back home in in 1997 because these people were also his children. Well, when I, I prayed that, then um, when we finished the sermon, we went to the fellowship hall, which is no more than about 20 feet of distance between buildings from the sanctuary. And by the time that we reached over there, the fellowship hall, the temperature changed and dropped 30 degrees. Now, all those brothers scrambled for their coats, and the visiting pastor's daughter, uh, Enrique's daughter, said she was only like uh, 17 or something at the time, and she stood shivering because she only wore a a T-shirt, which had bling-blings on it, and uh, and a skirt. And she said, I just knew that when you prayed that I didn't wear enough clothes today. So anyway, that was the 27th time. Now, the 28th time was in 2019. I was asked by Brother Bikina Phillips, a pastor in Uganda, who wished to hold a revival uh, for a town that they wished to introduce the message to. It was raining, and he, he, he wrote to me on a Thursday night. He said, we're supposed to start the meeting tomorrow, and it's been raining ever since, and uh, it's continuing to rain, and it's not letting up. And if you've ever been in Uganda, you could have days on end of monsoons come through. All right. <clears throat> well, the missionary revival was to begin on Friday, and they wanted the monsoon rains to stop so they could begin their revival. He remembered the stopping of the storm in Uganda, and so he wrote to me. He said, uh, "He said, I will, I will pray right now." Or excuse me. He, and I said, "I will pray right now. So let me know when the rain stops." In other words, I was hoping to get immediate feedback, but I didn't hear nothing for a couple of weeks. And then I, I wrote to him, and I said, "Well, you know, whatever happened." Well, uh, so we prayed, and the rain lifted, and they were able to hold their meetings on Friday. So he notified me right after the four days of preaching what God had did. Immediately after we had prayed, God lifted the rain and then brought it back the day the revival had ended. All right? Well, that's the way God works, you know. All right, now, uh, number 29, the 29th time I witnessed the power of God, It happened in 2019. I was asked by a brother in Uganda to pray for rain as their crops were dying because of a drought. I asked, I believe it was Samson Lubogo. I asked him if he was in attendance when the storm was stopped, and and he said yes. So I told him that God can do the same thing for him again, only this time uh, he could give them rain. 
So we prayed together, and then God sent the rain within the very hour that we prayed. Now, the, the 30th time, I was witness to the power of God. I got a message from Malawi, Brother Webster Chitsula, that the rain was so powerful that their crops were flooding. I agreed to pray for their situation, and God answered our prayers and stopped the storm and the rain, and stopped the rain and saving their crops from the storm. The, the uh, 31st time, I witnessed the power of God. It was 5 o'clock, and I was working at, for Oldest Elevator as a senior buyer. Gary Morgan, the other senior buyer, this is about 1982 or so. Uh, Gary Morgan, the other senior buyer, came to me, and he said, um, the rain won't let up, and we want to go home. He said, I know God answers your prayers, so would you mind asking him to allow the rain to let up for five minutes so we can get to our cars and go home without getting all wet? I said, let's just bow our heads right now, and we did on the spot. You know, you can't do that today. They, they'd probably fire you. But God answered our prayers immediately, and we got in our car, and as we were exiting the parking lot, the rain started up again. So he only gave us the five minutes that we asked him for. He gave us the five minutes back and then... Uh, break in rain just long enough for us to get in our cars and go home. All right. The 32nd time I witnessed the power of God, I was with uh, Brother Michael driving through Oklahoma, and we had bad rain. And as it came down so hard, we didn't know if we should pull over or not because we, we didn't know how long it would come down, and we had, we had to be on schedule because we are going to meet with Brother Alan McDougall uh, for supper and then drive after that to uh, Brother Nathan Ducharmes in Texas, and then we stayed with him for a few days. We prayed for the rain to cease, and God lifted the rain from the road before us, and it rained on each side of the highway, but not on the road itself. So explain that, just like explain my wife and I driving through the tunnel where there's fog above us, fog on each side of us, but the road was completely clear. All right, <clears throat> now, the 34th time, and, there, and uh, there has been countless other times. I prayed for God to stop rain so the brothers' crops and homes would be spared. And God answered those prayers. There's times coming from Uganda, other times in Malawi. Uh, either I prayed for rain or I prayed to stop rain. But then they, the brothers told me an hour after I prayed that uh, their, their prayer was answered. <coughs> the 35th time, even a couple of years ago, uh, my uncle called me and said, a huge hurricane was headed for his house, and he, and, we, and, uh, and, and he called basically. He said, I know that God has your prayer, so I want you to pray for me. And so the hurricane turned an hour and a half after we prayed. The hurricane turned 90 degrees angle and avoided his home altogether. The same hurricane was going straight, because I, I told my brother, I told my sister I'd pray for her also, and I told Brother Ron Har that I would pray for him. Uh, and so <clears throat> it turned... And it went into land, cross land. And the same hurricane was going straight uh, for a brother's home in Florida, his brother Ron, and also my sister Beth's home. And uh, the Tampa Bay had emptied out, and they were all afraid when it came in, it would actually come in with a fury and flood their homes. But <clears throat> it came back in very gently, and no damage was had. And my sister only lives two blocks from the from the. Tampa Bay, so that was a miracle in itself. Now, the 36th time in December of 2022, I had a stroke and was completely paralyzed for a few days. I was 50 over 30 and just about straight lined. And my daughter Christina was visiting at that time and I had to take charge because the nurses just stood around as if they'd never been through nursing school. I mean, it was kind of something to watch. <clears throat> anyway, my other daughter came by after that and I can thank the Lord for it because she was weeping and I told her I just wanted to go home. But she said, you promised that we would go together in the rapture. I said, if I promise it, then I will do all that I can to keep my promise. The neurosurgeon told me and my wife and daughter that after reviewing my MRI, I should be dead or at least a vegetable sucking uh, my food through a straw. But I am a witness to the healing power of my God. The 37th time, 21 years ago, in 2002, I prayed for four people in, in Stephen Abali's church in Uganda who wanted to pray, 
on prayer because they were diagnosed with TB, tuberculosis. I called my friend Ben Caleb, who contacted uh, Stephen Ibali this morning, actually this morning, and he says that in the last 21 years now, he is not aware of anyone who has ever died from TB. So these people made it. All right. Well, from the third Exodus, Brother Brown said, Elijah, the one of the greatest prophets of the age, only done four things supernatural in all his life of 80-some years. So, hey, Elijah was older than me when he went up. So hopefully I'll make it, all right? And, he, and Elisha, with a double portion, done only eight. And we see thousands of times thousands with our own eyes. Look at the angel of the Lord in the pillar of fire, scientific search, uh, taking it into all the world, knowing that they're going to be judged by it. So we have witnessed the lame walking in South Dakota, the man paralyzed, he was, and we had prayed for him. Two discs were fused together, and we prayed, and God restored his spine. He walked again. We saw a diabetic man gain green foot, all muscles, tissue in, in, you know, in, in uh, all that was in his heel was all cut out, and God restored his foot. We prayed for the deaf to hear, and Sister Heidi's sister was healed in Australia. Uh, the deaf were raised. Uh, an Iowa mother died at the dinner table in Ohio, and after laying my lips to her lips, it was my mother-in-law. And breathing in, she came back to life. Now, people might say, well, that was just uh, giving her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, revived her. Well, you know what? Then Elijah gave the boy mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and so did Elisha give the boy mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And so did uh, Malachi gave mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And so did Brother Branham. He, Brother Branham said, a man had died of tuberculosis. I had to stuff his entrails in his mouth and then put my mouth on it. So, you see, if you know how God works in a pattern, you follow the pattern, and you have the same results, all right, because he doesn't change. Now, we have the dead stick budded, which was debarked for 10 months. And uh, after laying on it for five months, it budded and grew two leaves. We have the, a cancer of the uterus in a pregnant woman healed in Indiana. We have a baby born uh, with a hip out of socket healed in Kentucky. We had a baby born in Kentucky with his head not growing together, grew back afterwards. We had an ITP patient. My own daughter was healed in Hamilton, Ohio. A man's dying of, of, of lung cancer healed in Kentucky. Tumors healed by Indiana man Guy Gillis. Uh, in prayer, after prayer, neurotic healed and restored in, in their marriage in Poland. That's, see, I don't even have that listed as like 30, this would be 38, all right? Um, I never mentioned this one before, but I was with Brother Michael, and uh, we were in Poland, and we had a, a healing line, and there was actually a woman <clears throat> who had been raped, and she was in neurosis, and uh, she was healed in that prayer line. Then there was a man with 30 years with an ulcer. He was also healed in, in Poland. And a man there who had asthma for 28 years and even asked Michael to give him some medication to help him. Remember that? Because, uh, you know, he knew your wife, wife was a, a nurse. So he asked for medication, but he was healed. So the power over the weather turned the temperature down 30 degrees uh, in one hour's time. And that took place both in Kentucky and in Argentina. A storm was stopped in, in Uganda. Horizontal rainbow appeared over the church in DRC. Uh, hurricane turned directions, etc. TB cured in four believers in Uganda. And no doubt there are many more that I just haven't come to my remembrance. But let's just pray, praise God and let's just pray that we could give him all the glory that he would do for each of us. Like I told my grandson when he came out this morning and we're standing in the back and he he said, great. He said, I really enjoy that, Grandpa. And I said, well, if you are the same age I was, so if you would just be a witness to what God is doing and tell him that you're going to witness if God does something, you're going to witness to everybody, then God will do things so that you do witness so that he gets the glory. You see, this is not about Brian Kosorek. It's about a man who has said, I'm going to be a witness. It's like Brother Brad. I'm going to be a witness and look at all the things in his life he did. So let's just bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all these wonderful things that you have done. There's over 40 of them, and, and Elijah only had four, and, uh, and we're thankful for those four. And we know that um, 
Elisha had eight, and yet this is uh, this is four four times that eight. So, uh, and actually five times the eight. And so, Lord, we're we're thankful, Lord, that you've done all these things, and you will continue to. I I don't believe for one minute that you have stopped. I, I I'm looking for a resurrection, and I'm looking for a rapture, and I know those are both supernatural things. And so I know I have at least two more things coming. But Lord, we may have more things. You know, um, my health has been restored, and 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 so we have much more to offer you. So Father, we just thank you, uh, f you know, for for just being with us all these 70 years. And uh, it seems like uh, more than every two years, maybe every one point some years, you've done something supernatural in my life. So I want to thank you for that, and just that we could be a witness to what a glory that you have shown us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. But we thank God. You know, I thank God that <clears throat> my healing and everything is, is, is com I, I think it's complete. I really do. I think the only thing is I'm just old. <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't run. At 65 years old, I couldn't run either. And I couldn't jump. I haven't been able to jump my whole life. I mean, I was a young athlete, and I could do a backflip, no problem. But I, I couldn't jump 18 inches off the ground. So, you know, <clears throat> white man can't jump, I guess. But God can. So. <clears throat>